Good morning, Christ Community Church. Happy Lord's Day to you. It's Thursday. You might be able to tell that because it's probably the morning you remember where the sun was so full and the sky was so blue. Hopefully this will be not a distracting place as you may hear some breeze, you may hear some geese honking, but I wanted to get outside with you in God's light, in God's creation and share his word with you. Hopefully you got the email that we send each week and this past email I mentioned that if there was ever a time for us to heed and hear and believe the words of First Peter, it's now. If there's ever been a time for, for me in my life to say, I'm in exile, I, this is not my home, it's now. No matter how this trial has affected you, whether you're in fear or you're exhausted or angry, confused, perplexed, wondering when it's going to end, what's the next step, all those discombobulating realities should be giving us encouragement to activate the theology we've been holding and studying for months. This is not a time for us to have our theology of God's sovereignty formed. These are times in which that which we believe the scriptures teach, the theology of the gospel coming to bear in our lives an imperishable seed planted in us that we would have hope in a world that's not ours to control, that's even not our home until Jesus comes to reign fully, now's the time for faith in that to be activated. And I hope that you've experienced that. That's one of the reasons for the testimonies that you've heard. Would we hear how God has activated the faith of, of people in our midst, those whom we've covenanted with in membership? And we'll do that for weeks to come. The other thing I wanted to share with you is if there's ever been a time in my life where I do hope and pray, that our in-home worship context might last just long enough, not to keep us from worshiping not together, not to keep us from the Lord's table, but would it happen long enough for new patterns to develop in your life? That is my prayer. I want you to imagine with me the week one or two, whether it's a, a father, a head of a household, awkwardly walking through the, the, the order of worship with his family, or maybe it's a single individual, reaching out to a friend and saying, let's go through this together, it's kind of odd, and, and, and for a while it, it, it's new. But what happens when rhythms form week after week? What does it look like when at the end of this journey, a husband, a father, a friend, a community member is, is confident to reach out to those in our care, whether it's, again, a peer or whether it's a father with his children saying, I want to call you to worship and I want to speak the gospel over you. And we're going to listen to the word of God preached, but it's my calling to lead my family in this time. It's my prayer that this will last long enough for our community that new patterns develop that when your children and my children are my age, they look back and say, at that time when everything was upside down, our family experienced God work in a new way. I hope that's going to be true for your family, for our church community, even though I cannot wait till we are together again and we break bread together. Acts 20 verse 7 says, on that first day of the week when we gathered together to break bread, I'm, I'm convinced that the Lord's Supper is meant to be when we're together, not virtually when we're apart, so we're not doing that. Our elders do not feel that's the way we'll do it, but oh, how sweet it will be when we're sharing in that together. So we're going to continue in 1 Peter. We're going to look at chapter 3 verses 15. I'll, I'll, I'll back up to read what we finished with last Lord's Day on Easter, all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 22. Let's hear God's word read together. If you're not standing, let me ask you to stand. I, I would encourage you to do that. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, 
now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Father, would you help us now in this time and space to hear and heed your word. As the breeze blows, would your spirit blow through this sermon? Fill our hearts with hope, with faith. Work in our church, I pray. Work at Christ's community. Work in the homes and in the hearts of those who hear this together with me. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. This is a weird passage. And as you might see from the sermon title, it's a weird passage for weird times. And it shows us a wonderful Savior. What what I want to ask you to do is consider that this passage of the Bible is pulling you and I out of our circumstances that we get sucked into. You you and I, in different ways, surely, but we we together, I'm assuming, have just been sucked in to all of this. This morning, so listen to the radio, I'm sucked into data. Not the same data as maybe when I was checking every day the number of COVID cases or the number of deaths. This morning, I listened to 22 million people filing for unemployment related to COVID-19 job loss. This is vast. I've talked to so many of you, and you go the, the whole gamut of fears and anxieties about your health to frustrations about government overreach. I, I was a political science major, and I'm, I'm actually interested in what's going on with executive powers and states' rights, and I'm not going to get into all of that. But I want you to consider, have you been sucked in? Here's a question. What sucked you in and got all your attention and and got you all riled up before this situation? Because here's my guess. It was something else. Maybe it was your home. Maybe it was your work. Maybe it was the way someone, your employer treats you. What sucked you in before? We have a tendency to get just sucked into situations. This situation is global. This situation is broad. This situation is diverse. But I got the same heart as I had before this situation, and I get sucked into things. It's so hard to step out of the moment, isn't it? It's so hard to pull back. In this text, Peter helps us pull back. And and it's a weird passage, but he's going to go into the days of Noah. He's going to say some things about Jesus. And I want to just ask you to let them be said in such a way as to pull you way out of your situation. Why do we get sucked in? One of my favorite counselor theologians, uh, when we lived in Pennsylvania, I would see him frequently, hear him speak frequently because he was in Philadelphia. Paul Tripp said this, Sin causes us to shrink our world down to the size of of our world or sin causes me to shrink my life down to the size of my life sin shrinks things and so this this massive global situation first of all if we we think we can comprehend it all or if we think we have a very clear cogent thought out opinion about it the danger of it is is everything shrunken down to what i can fathom what i who i'm listening to in the news what my capacity is to take all the data in And and because I'm a fallen, finite human being, I'm going to shrink what is happening in the world down to the world as I know it. We're Americans. We shrink the world down to the size of America when there's global things that have been going on for centuries, for millennia. We're, we're, We're individuals and we shrink our world down to what's going on in my home and my job and my life and my marriage. Here's what we need, and it's what I think this text gives to us. An unshrunk theology of Jesus Christ and all that he's done and who he is as our Savior. An unshrunk theology of suffering, of our salvation, of God's sovereign glory. And that's what Peter gives to us in this text. I'm going to try the best I can to make it clear for you. But my request of all of us is, would we ask for God's spirit help right now, just 10 minutes into this time, Lord, help me step way out. Give a different purview that I'll see things differently. 
and may it come by your word. The passage before you is laid out with four parts. You see the outline. Christ in the flesh, Christ in the spirit, Christ in symbol, and then Christ in heaven. Peter's going to touch on all those. I, I won't spend equal time in all of them, but my hope is that it will help you step out. And this complex passage will even help us make sense of these times. Now, before I get into all those four parts, I want you to just notice with me really simply, okay, so we get lost in the, in the chaotic things, really simply, where does this text end or how does it end? Notice with me in verse 22. This text ends with Jesus in heaven and all things subjected to him. Do you see that? All powers, all authorities subjected to Jesus. It's interesting that he uses the word, Peter uses the word subjected to or submitting to because we've just come out of a series, a, a whole section of the book that is about you and I as citizens being subject to the authorities over us. Servants being subject to your masters. Wives being subject to your husbands. Husbands, husbands being subject to the role God's given to you. We've had this theme of subjection or submission through the last chapter or so. And then chapter 3 ends with everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth being subject to Jesus. Don't lose that simple thought as we proceed. Second thing, a little simple note before we get into the depth here, where does this text start? Before it talks about Christ in the flesh, it, it starts with suffering. From suffering to subjection of all things, to, to Christ ruling over all things. It starts with our suffering he links it to Jesus' suffering, and it ends with his exalted glory with all things that bring suffering being under him. That's the simple beauty of this text. But let's talk about suffering, Christ in the flesh, for Christ suffered. The way that Peter enters into that is if we go back to verse 15, our Easter text, you and I, with the Spirit inside of us, are called to live in such a way that people ask us for a reason, for the hope that we have. And we're to live and, and show the hope we have gently, respectfully. But when we do that, when we say that I'm not panicked because Jesus is on his throne, or when we say that I'm not going to give into the flesh because I've been bought with a price, it's not my body, when, when we do follow after Christ, we can expect and we should sub sub expect to be slandered, to be reviled, to be put to shame, to be thought of as foolish, to suffer undeservedly for good. We're going to talk more about that differently next week, but that's been a theme of the letter. If you are a Christian, expect to suffer for Christ suffered when he was in the flesh. And I'm going to share some things from a sermon that I listened to this week, preached in 1994. I was a sophomore in high school. John Piper preached it. I believe it was at a missions conference. And as I listened to him preach this text, I just realized I needed to share a lot of it with you. I want you to think with me about how Peter tells the early church, expect to suffer. And how foreign that is to us. And here's what John Piper said. He said, you know, maybe that sounds irrelevant to you. That, that, that it's going to be the norm for a Christian to suffer. Here's what he said. If that sounds irrelevant to you, it may be because you and me, like most Americans, are insulated from the bigger world outside of our, of our country, which we're about 5% of the countries in the world, 5% of the population of the world. I think that's what he meant there. And outside of our own little American era, which over the last 300 plus years is about 5% of, let's just say the 6,000 years to use that data point. For most of the world and for most of history, being a Christian has not been safe. Stephen Neal, in his book, uh, The History of Christian Missions, he said that in the first three centuries, when the church was spreading like wildfire, every Christian knew that sooner or later, he might have to testify to his faith at the cost of his life. It's normal, not abnormal, for Christians to be hated. And just think of doing evangelism early in the church in which you could not and you would never make any promises to anyone that things are going to go better for them on earth. Because if they believe the, the offering you were giving, the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, they would be risking their lives. Suffering would be the next thing. It is normal, not abnormal, Piper says. It may feel abnormal here, 
But Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 9, you will be hated by all nations. And, and I'm going to quote very directly from Piper's sermon here because he said it in 1994. He said, there's warning for us here in America. He said, I get the impression that we're in a bitter reactionary mood as Christians in America. The atmosphere seems to be one of acrimony and rancor and mean-spiritedness in the public square, as if the liberal, humanistic, secular, relativistic, cultural elites have taken our Christian world from us. He said this, I think the time is right for a heavy dose of the teaching of 1 Peter. As in chapter 4, verse 12, which we'll look at in weeks to come, Do not be surprised, Peter says, by the fiery ordeal that comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter is laboring in this letter to say, you're an alien, you're a stranger. It should not be strange for you if the world doesn't make sense to you. If it turns upside down, if you say that God's in authority and and viruses cause you to have to wrestle with the hope that you have and people say, how's God sovereign now? For you to wrestle with God describing himself as the healer, the great judge, the rescuer, the king of all kings over all nations, while our nation is in discussion as to the limits of authority of executive privilege for those who are in positions of authority. Christian, are you surprised that your faith is intersecting this experience in a new way and it's activated? Don't be surprised. Across history, the normal place of the gospel advancing, the normal place of hearts growing is when there has been personal and communal and cultural confusion and suffering for the Christian. Look how Peter takes the theme of suffering and then in verse 18 he says, for Christ also suffered. He takes our experience of suffering, being reviled for the face, slandered and thought of as foolish, narrow-minded, maybe even bigoted people who say the narrow way is through Jesus alone, Peter takes that suffering and says, let's talk about your suffering in light of Christ's suffering. That's why you suffer. And then in verse 18, there are four things about Christ's suffering, and they're just beautiful. And I want to just point them out to you and let them sit, savor these things. For Christ suffered once. That's the first thing. His suffering is done. The suffering for sin has been paid. While we suffer in this world, it's not the wrath that is due to us in our sin. That's been paid by Christ and Christ alone. Suffering, Jesus' suffering, has fulfilled all the suffering associated with the wrath of God against sin. We suffer the consequences of sin. We live in a world that's broken, waiting for redemption. But you and I do not suffer the consequence and the suffering and the curse of sin because Jesus suffered once. It's done. There's no second, third, fourth repeat sacrifice. This is why the Reformation, the Reformers came out and said, Mass, the, the, the transubstantiation view of the Lord's Supper where Christ is re-sacrificed in the Catholic tradition is wrong. It's done. One sacrifice and it's over. There's no purgatory because purgatory would be me having to go suffer for what I didn't do in this life, but the suffering was done once and it's finished. It's fulfilled by Jesus. Verse 18 continues, he suffered once for sins. He suffered against our our, our great enemy. The great enemy of your and my soul is not Satan. It's not the deceiver. All the deceiver can do is show us that we're sinful. Jesus suffered the wrath of God for sins, our great enemy, the enemy within. Once for sins as a substitute. See what Peter says, the, un, the righteous for the unrighteous. At 2 Corinthians 5, 21, him who knew no sin became sin, that we would become the righteousness of God. We switch places. Once for sins, as a substitute, and then the last thing, verse 18, to bring us to God. You and me, by faith, Christ is with us. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. The Spirit lives inside of us such that we can speak the oracles of God to one another because God is within us. He's come to us in Christ. And we will be with him forever and ever and ever and ever because of the one work that Jesus did in his cross and in his resurrection for us. Now notice with me in this this text, Peter links 
our suffering to Christ's suffering and on the full meaning of it in verse 18. But if we took out verses 19 to 21 and you just, just got rid of that confusing part, our text almost flows perfectly to go from verse 18 to verse 22. I just want you to notice that. It's, it's rather fascinating that you could have the Bible talk to us about how Jesus suffered once for sins. He suffered once the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. And then verse 22, he's now gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God and will reign. But see, Peter doesn't do that. He doesn't skip from verse 18 to verse 22. What happens is as Peter talks about how Jesus suffered in the flesh, and then he was resurrected, and he he talks about how Jesus was resurrected in the spirit. It's like it just jogs a thought in Peter's mind, and he jumps to an entirely different era. He starts talking about Christ in the Spirit, in Noah's time. It's a complex set of verses. And and let me just read them to you. So in the Spirit, Christ went and he proclaimed to the spirits in in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. What in the world does that mean? Well, throughout history, there's been three major interpretations, and I'm not going to camp out on them all. But one thought is that Jesus here descended into hell and basically proclaimed his victory over spirits in the prison of hell somewhere after his resurrection before he ascended to the Father. But if that's the case, then why reference the time of Noah? I don't think that's satisfactory. A a, a second opinion that's gone uh, a little bit, I'd say, off the rails, at least into mysticism, is, is... Jesus didn't go proclaim to the spirits in prison who were human spirits that rejected the gospel. He went and proclaimed to fallen angels, those spirits who are now in prison. But then if that's the case, then why reference people in the days of Noah particularly? So I don't think that's satisfactory. Here's where I lean, and I think it's the simplest approach, which is often best. Christ went and in the spirit was present in the days of Noah, and when Noah spoke about God's righteousness and that repentance was required and that God's people had rejected God in all his glory and holiness, that it was the Spirit of Christ speaking through Noah and proclaiming in such a way the way of righteousness. And God was patient in that day, but only eight persons were saved in the end because people rejected the message of rescue. And I think what Peter's saying is, it wasn't just Noah that spoke. The Spirit of Christ spoke through Noah. And I think it's the text of this book that actually gives us permission to lean that way. Because back in chapter 1, verse 11, in one of our earliest messages together, we saw that concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, they searched, they inquired carefully, inquiring what person and what time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings and the glories of Christ. Noah is one of those prophets through which the Spirit of Christ declared the single message of rescue by God's righteous way, his way of rescue from wrath for sin. It's a complex set of verses. But that means that those who are now in prison, when Jesus went in the Spirit, he proclaimed to those in the day of Noah who rejected God and rejected the word who are now in prison that's what Peter's saying there now they're in the chains of hell and there's no there's no relief to their torment there's no way out and that's consistent with what Jesus himself said in in the book of Matthew when he just I mean Luke excuse me 16 verse 24 that they are in prison in the place of torment awaiting final judgment so what's the point the point is worship to me The point is Peter telling us that Jesus was not just the the God in the flesh that he walked with those three years. And Peter saw Jesus teach with authority and heal people and drive demons out. He saw his cross. He saw his resurrection. He saw all the glory. But now Peter says, folks, time out. Step way back. He is so much greater than we can fathom. He was there proclaiming the, the way of rescue through his servant Moses. There's never been a time when Jesus was not He's from eternity unto eternity. And so Peter just steps way out, and I think the response should be worship. Second area of response should be warning. Heed the warning. Those who did not repent of sin, 
those who did not turn to God and say, we are not holy, rescue us from the wrath to come, those who reject God's way of rescue in Christ, eternal imprisonment is that which awaits. And that's what Peter, I think, is referencing here. That's a warning. And then thirdly, there's worship, there's warning, but I think there's comfort in these complex verses because eight persons were saved from the wrath that God spent against those who rejected him. We spend a lot of time thinking about numbers. I know I certainly do. How many people even are going to watch this video? How many people attend Christ Community Church? How many Christians do we know that are being impacted by you? Be very careful, church, to fixate on numbers when eight persons, just a, a minority of, of, of inconsequence, trusted in God's way of rescue. And God was glorified. And they were saved. And when all the world turns upside down and you suffer, and you turn to Jesus as the one who suffered the wrath that you're truly due, and you look foolish to the world as you're not trying to fix your life or you're not acting as though the world is spinning off its axes because God's in authority. If you're in the minority, it's okay. If I'm in the minority, what a blessed privilege to find rescue in God's way through Jesus. Let's keep going. Because then it's as if after Peter fixates on Jesus in the spirit in the days of Noah, and he starts to think about the flood and the way of rescue from the wrath of the water being spent against the world, he says, oh, this corresponds to the symbol of baptism. Let me just read that part to you. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but here's what Peter says. The symbol of our rescue from the wrath of God is baptism. And the water here is not the water of cleansing. In fact, Peter clearly says it's not about the, the, the body having its dirt be washed off from it. No, the water in this corresponds to the water of wrath by which God judged those who reject him. And the water in baptism is an appeal to God for a good conscience that comes through the resurrection of Jesus. What in the world does that mean? I think it's this. The waters of baptism symbolize our rescue in Jesus. Yes, it symbolizes our washing and our cleansing. But Peter is saying it symbolizes the wrath that you deserved. And somebody else took the wrath. And it was Jesus who the full extent, the flood of God's wrath against sin, covered him so that you have now the water of your own baptism appealing to God of the righteousness that's yours, that the wrath has been paid. So whether you were baptized as a covenant child, an infant, which as you know we believe is a beautiful gift of promise, the, the water of an infant baptism will always stand appealing to God symbolically for the one who takes hold of that salvation by faith and so you and I should be remembering our baptism. Remember it, remember it. It symbolizes that someone else bore the wrath of the flood of God's anger against sin. But maybe you were baptized later in life after you professed faith. Because you came to Christ from outside of a covenant family. And so, same thing. It's not you who appeal to God and say, God, it's my appeal by my faith I give to you. No, the scriptures say clearly, it's the water of baptism that appeals to God. Which is why, again, we're baptized once, not many times, where we say, I need to make another appeal, and another appeal, and another appeal. No. The symbol of our rescue is baptism. And that baptism corresponds to so many beautiful parts of our rescue. In this case, it corresponds to the fact that somebody else bore the wrath of sin, just like the waters and the floods in the days of Noah was God's wrath against those who rejected him. And it says that the eight persons were saved through water, which is just an interesting way to say it. When I consider my baptism and your baptism, it's, it's through water that we symbolically are received as clean and righteous and pure in God's sight, but it's also a symbol of what Christ underwent for us. We do not have any wrath of God ready to be spent on us because the flood fully consumed him. 
And then Peter goes from that beautiful thought that the resurrection proved that he bore the fullness of God's wrath to say, ah, he's been resurrected and now he's ascended and he's at the right hand of God the Father. He's in heaven with angels and authorities and powers now having been subjected to him. People of God, Jesus has never not been. He's from eternity unto eternity. Jesus condescended down to us and took on our frame and our flesh. And he was righteous, we were not. Jesus underwent the fullness of wrath for unrighteous people who turned to God through him. And God's given symbols for you to hold to, but right now in this moment, what is really going on in God's economy is nothing is insecure. Nothing. Not for God's child. Not for a baptized believer. Our world is in discombobulation and it sucks you and I in. And we get consumed by politics and consumed by data and consumed by other people's opinions of the politics and the data. And we're consumed by the fact that we don't know what's next. When is this going to end? And we're consumed by the fact that there's real pain and real suffering and real job loss and real fear. But as it sucks us in, please, people of God, let's heed the words of Peter. And we got to step way back. Further than is possible. Peter was with Jesus and he steps way back. The whole Bible steps way back. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that before the foundations of the world, those who are elect in Christ were chosen back before there was time. People of God, in the midst of any stress you're knowing, step way, way, way back. And let this weird text where Peter goes into the spirit of Christ in the days of Noah just be an example of, of how much greater your Savior is, how much more grand your salvation is than just God helping you make it through today in this crisis and this trial that we know. I keep wanting to sh share calmly with you through this video medium. I love this book. And here's my hope for you. That this week you'll experience an unshrunken theology. When you consider things you don't comprehend or you listen to opinions that you agree with or you listen to opinions you don't agree with, that you'll take all that in and you'll filter it through the grid of Jesus right now being in heaven and you being with him eternally and him proclaiming the gospel through Noah. And the craziness of that chasm of time that Peter just jumps between verses as an example to you and I that we don't have to have it all figured out right now. Don't live as though this day and age your primary citizenship is in a world that's shut down because the government shut our state down, because the federal government has shut things down, because hospitals are being overwhelmed in places other than here or fear that it could have. Do not let that be the world you're consumed with. Live here as a sojourner, as an alien. Have your faith activated in this trial. Love one another, serve one another, and then let all the commands we've looked at over the weeks past be where you live out your faith. I'll go backwards. Husbands, love your wives because Jesus is on his throne and the gospel's been preached to you by whoever shared it with you, the Spirit of Christ working through them, just as the Spirit of Christ spoke through Noah. Just fathom that and then go love your wife and your family and serve wherever you're called with your vocation. Wives, be secure because this is the security Peter says is real. It stretches all across history and the Spirit of Christ is in you. Servants, employees, those who are subject to another in this world, submit, don't begrudge it. You don't have to understand everything. Understand what's in these verses and may that be your perspective all the way onto our living in this place and time. In chapter 2 where Peter says, hey, be subject as citizens. We don't know when this is all going to lift. We don't even have to agree with it. Your elders are praying through what we do next. But I will tell you, it better not become my and your and your elders and your deacons and your church's primary priority. No, our priority is Jesus in heaven at the right hand of God and all things being subject to him and he reigns and we have nothing to fear.
I'm gonna pray. And hope that the wind didn't make it so you can't hear this recording. I love you and I ask that God would uncork his gospel story for you. And if right now you have been sucked into just the trial that this is, that you will feel just wind blow you way back and that your theology would unshrink and your view of how God works in the world would be bigger than it's ever been and you'd share that hope with others. Father, would you do that? That is our prayer. Jesus, thank you for suffering once for sin. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God and we anticipate experiencing the fullness of God with us. The fullness of your reign with everything subject to you. Viruses, authorities, every square inch of this world that we stand on, every breath, every knee bowed, every tongue confessing that you are Lord, would we step so far back that this weird text isn't even weird. It interprets and gives us clarity through whatever you have next for us this week to come. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, work among your church and bless your people as they worship in their homes and with their friends on this Lord's day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I love you. And so do the geese behind me. <laughs>